Uh, so thank you again for coming today. And um, I was I was saying to Ian, normally I, I find myself in the classroom and I'm used to walking around, so sticking me behind the podium. I'm like, I just want to wander. So if I start to do that, I might have to come back into place. Um, Steve and I are here, to take, are here today rather, to talk about the work that we've been doing um, with paramedics in terms of the physical demands of the job that they undertake. And one of the things I always think of is that paramedicine is not just about saving lives, it's about working in different environments, 12 months of the year, snow, rain, sleet, slush, heat, all of that, um, with all different walks of life and all kinds of different situations and, and uh, environments and scenarios. And um, most people don't understand or, t or have a true concept of how much weight you actually carry in a shift. And that's the work that we've uh, undertaken to do. <clears throat> so in 2012, I undertook uh, the first ever provincial health and injury study looking at paramedics uh, in this province. And part of the goal was to try and find out how, you know, what's the health status of paramedics? How many do we have? How many injuries do they have? And uh, when the data started to come back, I was shocked uh, at how many injuries were being reported, not only just the physical injuries, but also the mental health piece. Uh, we truly underestimated how much uh, mental health is a challenge for folks uh, in, the, in the profession. And um, we wanted to figure out, you know, what's the cause, the, at least for the work that Steve and I do with the, the physical injuries, where are they coming from, why are they coming, and, and what's the problem, or you know, why do we have these problems. Um, so we decided to undertake our physical demand study, and one of the approaches I've always taken to paramedic research, and it's rubbing off on Steve now because he doesn't have a choice, um, is that all the research that I slash we do in, is with paramedics, it's by paramedics, it's with paramedics, and it's for paramedics. So we take a very unique approach to uh, our research that we do and that we engage paramedics from front end to the back end. And to me, that's important. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Uh, and again, by engaging paramedics and by looking at the physical demands piece, it's one of the foundational first steps that we take to improving the health and safety uh, of the folks uh, in this room. So why do we want to know what the physical demands of the profession? Why do we care how heavy your bags are? Why do we care, care rather how many times you lift a stretcher up and down and how many stairs you go up and down and all around and all that kind of stuff? Why is it relevant? Uh, and it becomes very relevant because it provides a, bench, a benchmark that marks three, three particular things. It provides an opportunity for us to prioritize rather interventions to reduce high demand situations where possible. So if we can try and, and, and say, listen, you know, if we do this a little bit differently, it might make your jobs easier and therefore help keep you healthier. Uh, it leads to a better understanding of the physical capabilities required to be a paramedic. So in this case, the modified occupational requirements, uh, which is something that we've been working with the uh, Ottawa Paramedic Service with, or about. Uh, and it serves as a guide for paramedics in identifying and implementing appropriate treatment plans. How do we get people who are injured back to work safely and, and appropriately? So I've mentioned the word physical demands uh, a couple of times, and some of you are probably wondering what exactly it is. So the traditional or the typical definition is a systematic procedure that can be applied to observe. And this is key. This is where our paramedics play a very central role in our research. Uh, quantify, again, they're involved. Report on all the physical components of, of all essential and non-essential uh, tasks within a job. So this is what we did with, uh, with the paramedics. <coughs> So typically when, we're, when uh, PDA is being undertaken, it's usually with a trained ergonomist, someone who uh, probably is not a paramedic, most likelihood isn't, um, but they have the skills to say, okay, we, you know, this is how many times they've done this, how many times they've done that, and so on. The challenges with that, especially within this realm of healthcare, is that we're taking somebody, and I'm gonna pick on Steve, who doesn't have a healthcare background or healthcare exposure, and putting them into some potentially very, um, I'm going to say disturbing, disturbing uh, scenarios. I mean, the, you know, you take somebody who's never seen a VSA before. You say, okay, well, go and watch it. But the person's deceit will Things, bad things can happen to the ergonomist, and we don't want that. Um, and the other thing is, there's subtle things that happen on the job, whether you reach for a bag, and that's why I like, I think it was Greg, uh, Alberta. Um, sorry, Gary. Um, by wearing the cams, right? You could see everything that's done, but an ergonomist might not capture all that information, say, okay, well, yeah, they picked up a bag, whatever, it's not important, it's very relevant. 
Um, so we use a very non-traditional approach to a very non-traditional occupation. There's nothing typical. There's no such thing as a typical day in, in, the, in the life of a paramedic, no matter where you work, whatever service you're in. Um, so again, this is where we brought in the whole concept of having paramedics uh, work with us on our team. And we've been very fortunate in the last uh, several years to work with a number of services both in Ontario and across Canada and just like to acknowledge uh, some of the folks up here. So if uh, some folks have participated in our federal study where we engaged five services across the country, which Doug uh, spoke to this morning. Uh, we did some pilot work with Hastings County and Frontenac. We also did some work within Ontario with a few services and we've continued to engage with a couple of the other uh, services as well. And also, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge uh, some very critical support with respect to funding, uh, Cree MSD being one for sure, and uh, through Doug's program, through uh, Canadian Safety and Securities program, through MyTax, through CUPE, we have to acknowledge uh, we've had fantastic union support throughout all of this. We've had fantastic management and frontline support. So we're very fortunate, I think we're very unique as researchers, to have those relationships, and we very much appreciate that. So what do we do in terms of our methodology for our physical demand study? So well, let's, let's get some paramedics involved. So we put out essentially a job ad to the services that we knew that we were going to be working with. We asked the paramedics to submit uh, an application. So they put in a resume, they put in a cover letter and said, you know, why they wanted to work with us. And we selected, uh, the service didn't, but we did. We selected the folks that we were going to be working with and um, brought them in for a six-hour training day. We provided them what we called with a physical demands description handbook, which had all the information we wanted them to capture and then some, and uh, provided them with some additional instructions and uh, gave them basic equipment such as measuring tapes. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the rest that we use, but measuring tapes, markers, stopwatch. Stopwatch is really important. How fast or how slow do you go? Um, and we sent them out. We said, okay, you've got all the information. You're trained out to the community you go, and you're going to do some ride outs. So we had uh, each of the paramedics uh, that we trained for each of the services we did to two full 12-hour write-outs. And uh, we also asked them to collect qualitative data. We asked the, our, we call them the research assistants, the RAs, to ask the paramedics at the end of the call, how difficult a call was this for you? What did you think? How did you feel? So not only did we capture physical data, but we also captured um, that qualitative piece as well. So this is uh, a picture of... Uh, of us with one of the groups, I don't want to say it's New Brunswick, uh, so Steve, myself, and Kevin and Paul, and Brendan uh, standing at the top, or standing at the front rather, was uh, Steve's grad student uh, at Queen's. And this is one of our, our PDA workshops where we sat down, we trained the paramedics uh, to do the, um, the uh, assessments. So we worked with 13 paramedic services across Canada, again, from one end of the coast to the other, and uh, in Ontario as well. And when we look at all the services, the services collectively com uh, con completed about 900,000 calls. So it's a lot of data that uh, busy services as well as quieter services. We had 57 full shift, or 12, uh, 12 hour write outs rather, resulted in 237 unique calls. Of those, we used 190 in the data analysis to find out what exactly do you folks do on your calls and on your shifts when you're out there. And uh, when we look at it in terms of the CTAS level or CTAS um, scores, uh, you know, almost 80% of the calls are CTAS 2s, twos, twos, or 1, 2s, or 3s. So it's the majority of the calls. High volume, high high acuity, sick people. Okay. Oops, oops, come back. Uh, might be a little difficult to read, but in terms of the frequency and the number of things that you do and the most, most frequently occurring task, novel thought, lifting a stretcher. Right? You do that a lot in your jobs. Uh, followed by horizontal patient transfers, stretchers, uh, pushing and pulling, uh, and it goes down from there. And then we had a collection of other things that fell into the other category. When we asked paramedics to say, you know, tell us about your perception of the call, how did you feel about the call, one of the things they noticed is that the high acuity calls, the CTAS 1s and 2s, are not only physically demanding, they're also mentally demanding. So you have that combination of the higher the acuity, the higher the, um, the challenges for those, uh, for those individuals. So what did we find overall in just a bit of a nutshell? So the physically demanding tasks uh, identified vary by geographical location. We see it, again, from one end of the country to the other end of the country. We also see variations between Canadian and American data as well. Uh, the C task level is definitely one of the most important determinants of physical demands faced by paramedics, recognizing the higher C task levels mean higher demands. And you saw that in the, in the video from uh, Alberta where they were trying to intubate. You know, you had a patient who started out as having allergic reaction, became anaphylactic, required intubation. That whole 
call scenario changes in terms of level of difficulty from something that could have been straightforward to something that became very complex and a lot more things going on. Uh, stretcher loading, which a number of folks have spoken to this morning and will continue to be an issue and will continue to look at as we move forward as researchers is the stretcher loading, uh, power loads, power lift systems, and uh, lifting and carrying the patient equipment. And I still remember the first day, and, and Steve's going to hit me for this probably, when we were doing some work with the auto paramedic, auto paramedic service and picked up two of the bags, and it's like, these are heavy. <laughs> yep, they're heavy. Uh, and it's what you carry, you know, and it's what not every system has, you know, backpack systems. And uh, it's a lot of work for folks. So in terms of the qualitative data, again, as I mentioned earlier, paramedics' perceptions of emotional, clinical, and physical demands are affected by the CTAS level. The higher the CTAS level, the higher the perception that there's, it's, it's more for them. Uh, and the perception of physical demands is in keeping with the actual physical demands. So if they say, you know what, my CTAS one call, I did, it feels like I did 700 things, it's because you did. And it's, uh, it ties in quite legitimately with that. All right. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and let him follow up with what are we going to do with the information that we've collected from all these wonderful places. So my job is to talk a little bit about, uh, as Renee mentioned, what can we do with this information? <clears throat> so a lot of what I'm going to talk about for the next five or so minutes is think, asking you to think a little bit out of the box and think about how we approach this problem of, of optimizing performance in the paramedic system, not only in terms of response times and patient care, MSD prevention, but how do we consider this at a system level? Um, so we've been playing around with some, some different methodologies and different techniques to try to leverage some of this data and look at how we can use it to drive some decisions at an organizational or operational level. So what I'm presenting to you is not something I suggest you necessarily do tomorrow, but what I want to do today is plant a kernel to get you to think a little bit more about ways that we might be able to think about exposures to paramedics and monitoring those exposures so that we can make very informed decisions uh, about deployment and work organization in a way that balances both the, the health and well-being of the paramedic with uh, standard performance metrics that you're interested in. For the folks in the room <coughs> that would uh, sort of be involved in this sort of decision making, how many of you use CAE Deploy or are familiar with CAE Deploy as a, as a software package that might be used to make data-driven decisions about deployment? A couple people. What would you know it by? Okay, so system status management. The, the idea is some type of software that's gathering data, providing you with information, and helping you make decisions about deployment. Uh, Dark Horse is a vendor, CAE Deploy. It's a couple different vendors in this place. And probably can see the caption in your notes. It's, it's quite small here. Uh, but they talk about historically, paramedic services have not been able to quantitatively analyze the deployment strategies uh, and response capabilities. So these software packages provide that utility. What if we consider paramedic workload? So again, I'm trying to think a little bit out of the box. What if we can use information that's gathered through these systems and based on what we know about how things like CTAS affect exposures, can we start to maybe model or predict an exposure profile and actually use this as a metric to consider? So we had an excellent opportunity to work very closely with Hastings Quinty. Uh, for those of you that uh, saw Doug's presentation, you probably understand the relationship and our ability to access some of that data. But we had a really unique opportunity to look under the hood and try to understand operationally what's happening in their service. So we had full access to their deployment plan which provides some information about how they deploy, when they deploy, what situations, how uh, different services are staffed. So things that, generally speaking, um, for an ergonomist and researcher like myself, probably wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking of that traditionally, tend to spend a lot of time, much like we've talked about today, on some of those very high priority issues like stretcher loading, like low back pain and that, that type of thing. So we try to step back and look more at a, at a service level perspective you can see in the top right, uh, folks may have seen similar figures before, but looking at the unit hour utilization rate, so how are our ambulances being utilized it, within that service? How does that utilization vary over, over the day? So what do we do with all that? Well, so we know the probability or likelihood of calls happening in certain jurisdictions at certain times of day, certain types of calls, but now using some of our PDD data, we can start to look at determinants of exposures. So much like Doug talked about this morning about 
uh, some of the big data projects they're looking at and gathering data about uh, uh, from ambulance call reports and, and integrating some of this information. So we know, for example, the or can look at a profile of CTAS, for example, <coughs> over a certain jurisdiction for a certain period of time. Now, from the physical demands data, we can start to understand that if I have a high priority call versus a low priority call, that's going to expose me to different demands. And we've been able to tie in, in the, as you can see in the bottom right, some lab research where we actually quantify exposures uh, re related to specific activities. And I know uh, Drs. Lavender and Summerick will talk a little bit more about this in a moment. We draw on their data quite often as well. So we take this entire system level approach, understanding deployment, understanding how ambulances are being deployed in the service, and then making some predictions. Again, I'm, this is a, I'm planting a kernel, I'm not saying this is absolutely the best way to move forward, but we can start to make some best guesses about the exposure profiles that paramedics face um, in a shift over the course of a month, over the course of a year. In terms of how we do this, it's all based on probabilities. So I'm not going to walk through the flow chart in detail, but we know that there's some driving, we know that there's movements in the field. Those movements are going to depend on the patient acuity and the type of care that needs to be provided, and they correspond with certain underlying um, mechanical exposures in terms of spine compression, for example. Some factors that can affect it, things like patient weight, things like duration of the task. So we can model that based on the average patient profile that you might see, and we can predict that you know, on one call it might be a 175 pound patient, and then the next call we predict maybe it's 225 or whatever it might be. So we can make some best guesses here. When we model this, we use a software called Decre Discrete Event Simulation uh, through Extensim, which isn't particularly important. What is important is up in the top you see, uh, or in the, in the quadrant, you see four different quadrants. And that's a graphical representation of the different stations. So up in the top left is the Bancroft station, uh, Quinty West, is the Belleville station, is a Maydock station. So each of those stations have a certain number of ambulances, have a certain number of paramedics that are available. So we can model each station within this system uh, on its own merits in terms of what's available for an evening shift, a day shift, and a night shift. So what we can do with this information, I think this is potentially the magic that might have some use uh, to help understand and estimate um, exposure profiles is we can calculate things like cumulative, uh, cumulative spine exposure. So what's the cumulative demand in your body? And what you're seeing here is results from a simulation where we estimated the daily dose in Newton hours for a paramedic working a morning shift in the dark bars, an afternoon shift in the, sort of the lightest colored bars, and the night shift on the right. And we modeled that across different services. So again, we haven't gone out and directly measured this. I don't know if it, that's exactly what the exposure is, but based on some probability and some best guesses about determinants of, of being exposed to certain activities and the number of calls that are being experienced, we can start to estimate these exposures. So what's the value of this? Well, I can quickly look and scan from left to right, and I see that the cumulative exposure on the spines of folks working in Belleville and Quinty very different than those working in Madoc or Bancroft. Again, probably not surprising, but it gives us some way to start to understand and measure this. If I look even just within Belleville, the morning shift and the night shift, a little bit more exposure than folks working in an afternoon shift. Not a huge difference, but the modeling and the probabilities would, would suggest that there are some variations in exposures. What was more interesting to us is if we look at the variation in day-to-day -day exposure. So again, what I'm showing here is the cumulative demand on, on the spines of the paramedics. And we're looking at the variation day to day. So a low number means that typically, you're, whether it's high or whether it's low, it's typically the same day to day. And in Belleville and Quinty West, absolutely that's the case. In Madoc and Bancroft, huge variability. And for any of you that might work in a, in a more rural service, you probably appreciate that. You have a very demanding call, series of maybe uh, less demanding calls than another one that's a little bit more out of the box. Um, so it gives us a chance to model and understand <coughs> paramedic workflow from a different perspective, and these data may help support some decision making upstream. So, what are the implications? Again, I'm not saying this is the way to go, but let's think out of the box a little bit. What if we can start to consider workload as a measure in the deployment strategy? What if there's an opportunity to catch that workload metric 
and perhaps redeploy uh, an ambulance to some type of transfer activity rather than have them be in the, in the system to be able to respond to a, another high priority call that might expose them to a lot of physical demands. I know there's a lot of challenges to, to implementing that type of thinking, but again, just thinking out of the box a little bit. We've talked a lot about back care and training interventions earlier today. Well, if I think about a paramedic that might be in Belleville, for example, exposed to a high exposure profile with low variability, so it's high every day, I probably don't want to put them in the gym and having them work out with a lot of intensity every day. They're already getting a lot of physical demand in their job. Now, if I contrast that with Madoc and Bancroft, they have periods of high intensity, but a lot of variability. So maybe my approach to training is very much different with those folks because of the type of on-the-job exposures that they're seeing. So what we've been trying to do is, as much like Doug mentioned this morning, use some of the information we have, make some best guesses, and see if we can't find other ways, in addition to all of the, uh, the, the interventions that have been discussed, back care programs, changing around the vehicle. Maybe we can look at other options, even in terms of system-wide changes through deployment software to help create a... a a better, more um, safer, productive system for paramedics. One of the nice things we've done, I've had a number of talks with, uh, with Doug about, you know, how do we use this to make decisions and, and for the chiefs in the room, spend a lot of time advocating to council about, you know, what, what might be the effects of this or that. Well, here we ran a little simulation. So we estimated what the spine would be, what the spine compression would be in the present situation. But what if patient weight increases by 20%. It's probably not, not an unrealistic estimate if you look at the trajectory uh, of patient weight. So what's the effect of that? What if we see a 35% increase in call volume? What, what, what might we expect the increase in exposure to the paramedics to be? As you can see in the model here, particularly in Belgium and Quincy West, an increase in call volume is likely to have a much higher impact on the mechanical exposures to the paramedics than perhaps an increase in patient weight which we might all perceive as being uh, quite problematic. It's a physical weight that you, you can touch and feel. So again, just helps us use data a little bit differently to think about um, MSD prevention and exposure to paramedics in a different limelight. I'd just like to, uh, as, as Renee mentioned, acknowledge all the, the support and collaboration we've had from so many services uh, across the country. It's been an incredible learning experience, and much like Renee mentioned, uh, certainly eye-opening for me in terms of seeing the, the demands and the work that you do. And I do want to thank you and acknowledge you for that. Um, and with that, uh, we'd be happy to take a couple questions before we introduce our modes of conveyed <laughs> speakers. Thank you. If I could just ask one quick. There's been talk before about uh, a cumulative lifting uh, in that, uh, let's say you carry five tickets <coughs> through the day. On average, they're all 200 pounds. By the end of the day, somebody's going to tell me that I've lifted over 10,000 pounds or whatever. Do you, what's your feeling on that stat? Because I understand, yes, by the end of the day, I might be fatigued, but I would never turn around and say, oh, I lifted 10,000 pounds today. I mean, if I'm Bit, and I'm used to lifting 200 pounds, and I've done it over the course of the day. I've lifted 200 pounds five times. Is there any, uh, I don't know if that was even a part of your study where you looked at the accumulative amount of calls on the body. Yeah, it's uh, actually quite lucky to have in the room uh, Dr. Jack Callaghan, Canadian Research Chair in the Prevention of Low Back Injuries, and has done a tremendous amount of work in helping to understand the implications of, of cumulative loading as a mechanism to become injured. From our perspective, at this stage, we haven't had a lot of access to follow folks long term. Um, certainly understanding based on the research that cumulative load is a concern, it is a problem. However, sort of establishing a, a threshold value for yes, no poses a number of challenge, challenges for a number of reasons. Uh, the first of which is being our individual ability to, to bear load and to do work. Um, so for, for our research, we haven't considered that. We've looked to the research evidence to sort of draw some lines in the sand in terms of what the epidemiological evidence suggests. Um, but at this point, I think we're just trying to steer folks into thinking about monitoring these things rather than uh, um, sort of saying, thou shall do less than this, and if thou does more than this, 
it, it's the end. So just prompting a discussion and thinking in that direction.